work into the hands of his church, so dependent has the Lord made himself on them as his body, through whom alone his work can be done. So real is the power which the Lord gives his people to exercise in heaven and earth, that the number of the laborers and the measure of the harvest does actually depend upon their prayer. Solemn, seldom, solemn thought. Oh, why is it that we do not obey the injunction of the Master more heartily and cry more earnestly for laborers? There are two reasons for this. The one is, we miss the compassion of Jesus, which gave rise to this request for prayer. When believers learn that to love their neighbors as themselves, that to live entirely for God's glory in their fellow men, is the Father's first commandment to his redeemed ones, they will accept of the perishing ones as the charge entrusted to them by their Lord, and accepting them not only as a field of labor, but as the objects of loving care and interest, it will not be long before compassion towards the help hopelessly perishing will touch their heart, and the cry ascend with an earnestness till then unknown. Lord, send laborers. The other reason for the neglect of the command, the want of faith, will then make itself felt, but will be overcome as our pity pleads for help. We believe too little in the power of prayer to bring about definite results. We do not live close enough to God and are not enough entirely given up to His service and kingdom to be capable of the confidence that He will give it in answer to our prayer. O oh, let us pray for a life, so one with Christ, that His compassion may stream into us, and His Spirit be able to assure us that our prayer avails. Such prayer will ask and obtain a twofold blessing. There will first be the desire for the increase of men entirely given up to the service of God. It is a terrible blot upon the Church of Christ that there are times when actually men cannot be found for the service of the Master as ministers, missionaries, or teachers of God's Word. As God's children make this a matter of supplication for their own circle or church, it will be given. The Lord Jesus is now Lord of the harvest. He has been exalted to bestow gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. His chief gifts are men filled with the Spirit, but the supply and distribution of the gifts depends on the cooperation of head and members. It is just prayer will lead, lead to such cooperation. The believing supplicants will be stirred to find the men and the means for the work. The other blessing is to be asked, will not be less. Every believer is a laborer, not one of God's children who has not been redeemed for service and has not his work waiting. It must be our prayer that the Lord would so fill all his people with a spirit of devotion that not one may be found standing idle in the vineyard. Wherever there is a complaint of the want of helpers or of fit helpers in God's work, prayer has the promise of a supply. There is no Sunday school or district visiting, no Bible reading or rescue work, where God is not ready and able to provide. It may take time and importunity, but the command of Christ to ask the Lord of the harvest is the pledge that the prayer will be heard. I say unto you, he will arise and give him as many as he needeth. Solemn, blessed thought. <clears throat> this power has been given us in prayer to provide in the need of the world to secure the servants for God's work. The Lord of the harvest will hear. Christ, who called us so specially to pray thus, will support our prayers offered in his name and interests. Let us set apart time and give ourselves to this part of our intercessory work. It will lead us into the fellowship of that compassionate heart of his that led him to call for our prayers. It will elevate us to the insight of our regal position as those whose will counts for something with the great God in the advancement of his kingdom. It will make us feel how really we are God's fellow workers on earth to whom a share in his work has in 
downright earnest, then entrusted. It will make us partakers in the soul travail, but also in the soul satisfaction of Jesus, as we know how. In answer to our prayer, blessing has been given that otherwise would not have come. Lord, teach us to pray. Blessed Lord, Thou hast this day again given us another of Thy wondrous lessons to learn. We humbly ask Thee, O give us to see aright the spiritual reality of which Thou hast been speaking. There is the harvest which is so large and perishing, as it waits for sleepy disciples to give the signal for laborers to come. Or teach us to look out upon it with a heart moved with compassion and pity. There are the laborers, so few. Lord, show us how terrible the sin of the want of prayer and faith, of which this is the token. And there is the Lord of the harvest, so able and ready to send forth, send them forth. Lord, show us how he does indeed wait for the prayer to which he has bound his answer. And there are the disciples to whom the commission to pray has been given. Lord, show us how thou canst pour down thy spirit and breathe upon them, so that thy compassion and the faith in thy promise shall rouse them to unceasing, prevailing prayer. O our our Lord, we cannot understand how thou canst entrust such work and give such power to men so slothful and unfaithful. We thank thee for all whom thou art teaching to cry day and night for laborers to be sent forth. Lord, breathe thine own spirit on all thy children, that they may learn to live for this one thing alone, the kingdom and glory of our Lord, and become fully awake to the faith of what their prayer can accomplish. And let all our hearts in this, as in every petition, be filled with the assurance that prayer offered in loving faith in the living God will bring certain and abundant answer. Amen. With Christ in the School of Prayer by Andrew Murray, being read by Peter John Parisius, also known as Brian Dean. The audio is not copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire. With Christ in the School of Prayer, 10th Lesson. What wilt thou, or prayer must be definite? Quote, And Jesus answered him and said, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Unquote. Mark 10.51, Luke 18.41. The blind man had been crying out aloud, and that a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. The cry had reached the ear of the Lord. He knew what he wanted, and was ready to grant it him. But ere he does it, he asked him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? He wants to hear from his own lips, not only the general petition for mercy, but the distinct expression of what his desire was. Until he speaks it out, he is not healed. There is now still many a supplicant to whom the Lord puts the same question, and who cannot, until it has been answered, get the aid he asks. Our prayers must not be a vague appeal to his mercy, an indefinite cry for blessing, but the distinct expression of definite need. Not that his loving heart does not understand our cry, or is not ready to hear, but he desires it for our own sakes. Such definite prayer teaches us to know our own needs better. It demands time and thought and self-scrutiny to find out what really is our greatest need. It searches us and puts us to the test as to whether our desires are honest and real such as we are ready to persevere in. It leads us to judge whether our desires are according to God's word and whether we really believe that we shall receive the things we ask. It helps us to wait for the special answer and to mark it when it comes. And yet, how much of our prayer is vague and pointless? Some cry for mercy, but take not the trouble to know what mercy must do for them. Others ask, perhaps, to be delivered from sin, but do not begin by bringing any sin by name, from which the deliverance may be claimed. Still, others pray for God's blessing on those around them, for the outpouring of of God's Spirit 
on their land or the world, and yet have no special field where they wait and expect to see the answer. To all the Lord says, And what is it now you really want and expect me to do? Every Christian has but limited powers, and as he must have his own special field of labor in which he works, so with his prayers too. Every believer has his own circle, his family, his friends, his neighbors. If he were to take one or more of these by name, he would find that this really brings him into the training school of faith and leads to personal and pointed dealing with his God. It is when, in such distinct manners, we have in faith claimed and received answers that our more general prayers will be believing and effectual. We all know with what surprise the whole civilized world heard of the way in which trained troops were repulsed by the Transvaal Boyers uh, at Boyers, B-O-E-R-S, at Manjaba, that's M-A-J-U-B-A. And to what did they owe their success? In the armies of Europe, the soldiers fires upon the enemy standing in large masses, and never thinks of seeking an aim for every bullet. In hunting game, the boyer had learned a different lesson. His precise eye knew to send every bullet on its special message to seek and find its man. Such aim must gain the day in the spiritual world, too. As long as in prayer we just pour out our hearts in a multitude of petitions without taking time to see whether every petition is sent with the purpose and expectation of getting an answer, not many will reach the mark. But if, as in silence of soul, we bow before the Lord, we were to ask such questions as these. What is now really my desire? Do I desire it in faith? expecting to receive? Am I now ready to place and leave it in the Father's bosom? Is it a subtle thing between God and me that I am to have the answer? We should learn so to pray that God would see, and we would know what we really expect. It is for this, among other reasons, that the Lord warns us against the vain repetitions of the Gentiles, who think to be heard for their much praying. We often hear prayers of great earnestness and fever, in which a multitude of petitions are poured forth, but to which the Savior would undoubtedly answer, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? If I am in a strange land, in the interest of the business which my father owns, I would certainly write two different sorts of letters. There will be family letters giving expression to all the intercourse in which affection prompts, and there will be business letters containing orders for what I need. And there may be letters in which both are found. The answers will correspond to the letters. And each sentence of the letters containing the family news. I do not expect a special answer. But for each order I send, I am confident of an answer where the desired article has been forwarded. In our dealings with God, the business element must not be wanting. With our expression of need and sin, of love and faith and consecration, there must be the pointed statement of what we ask and expect to receive. It is in the answer that the Father loves to give us the token of his approval and acceptance. But the word of the Master teaches us more. He does not say, What dost thou wish? But, What dost thou will? One often wishes for a thing without willing it. I wish to have a certain article, but I find the price too high. I resolve not to take it. I wish, but do not will to have it. The sluggard wishes to be rich, but does not will it. Many one wishes to be saved, but perishes because he does not will it. The will rules the whole heart and life. If I really will to have anything that is within my reach, I do not rest till I have it. And so, when Jesus says to us, What wilt thou? He asks whether it is indeed our purpose to have what we ask at any price, however great the sacrifice. Dost thou indeed so will to have it that, though he delay it long, thou dost not hold thy peace till he hear thee? Alas, how many prayers are wishes, 
sent up for a short time, and then forgotten, or sent up year after year as a matter of duty, while we rest content with the prayer without the answer. But it may be asked, is it not best to make our wishes known to God and then to leave it to Him to decide what is best, without seeking to assert our will? By no means. This is the very essence of the prayer of faith, to which Jesus sought to train His disciples, that it does not only make known its desire and then leave the decision to God. That would be the prayer of submission for cases in which we cannot know God's will. But the prayer of faith, finding God's will and some promise of the word, pleads for that till it comes. In Matthew 9:28, we read Jesus said to the blind man, Believe ye that I can do this? Here in Mark he says, What wilt thou that I should do? In both cases, he said that faith hath saved them. And so he said to the Syrophoenician woman, too, Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Faith is nothing but the purpose of the will, resting on God's word, and saying, I must have it. To believe truly is to will firmly. But it is not such a will at variance with our dependency on God and our submission to Him. By no means. It is much rather the true submission that honors God. It is only when the child has yielded his own will and entire surrender to the Father that he receives from the Father liberty and power to will what he would have. But when once the believer has accepted the will of God as revealed through the Word and Spirit as his will too, then it is the will of God that his child should use this renewed will in his service. The will is the highest power of the soul. Grace wants above everything to sanctify as I restore this will, one of the chief traits of God's image, to full and free exercise. As a son who only lives for his father's interests, who seeks not his own but his father's will, is trusted by the father with his purpose, with his business. So, God speaks to his child in all truth. What wilt thou? As a son who only lives for his father's interests, who seeks not his own, but his father's will, he is trusted by the father with his business. So God speaks to his child in all truth. What wilt thou? It is often spiritual sloth that under the appearance of humility professes to have no will because it fears the trouble of searching out the will of God, or, when found, the struggle of claiming it in faith. True humility is ever in company with strong faith, which only seeks to know what is according to the will of God, and then boldly claims the fulfillment of the promise. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord Jesus, teach me to pray with all my heart and strength, that there may be no doubt with thee, or with me, as to what I have asked. May I so know that I desire that, even as ray petitions are recorded in heaven, I can record them on earth, too, and note each answer as it comes. May I know what I desire, that, even as my petitions are recorded in heaven, I can record them on earth, too, and know each answer as it comes. And may my faith in what thy word has promised be so clear that the Spirit may indeed work in me the liberty to will that it shall come. Lord, renew, strengthen, sanctify wholly my will for the work of effectual prayer. Blessed Savior, I do beseech thee to reveal to me the wonderful condensation Thou showest us, thus asking us to say what we will that Thou shouldest do, and promising to do whatever we will. Son of God, I cannot understand it. I can only believe that Thou hast indeed redeemed us wholly for Thyself, and dost seek to make the will as our noblest part, Thy most efficient servant. Lord, I do most unreservedly yield my will to Thee, as the power through which Thy Spirit is to rule my whole being. Let him take possession of it, lead it into the truth of thy promises, and make it so strong in prayer 
that I may ever hear thy voice saying, Great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Amen. With Christ in the School of Prayer by Andrew Murray. This is being read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. This is not copyrighted, so please feel free to make as many copies as you desire. Eleventh lesson. Believe that you have received, or the faith that takes. Quote, Therefore I say unto you, All things whatsoever ye pray and ask for, believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. Unquote. Mark 11, 24. What a promise, so large, so divine, that our little hearts cannot take it in, and in every possible way seek to limit it to what we think safe or probable. Instead of allowing it in its quickening power and energy, just as he gave it, to enter in and enlarge our hearts to the measure of what his love and power are really ready to do for us, faith is very far from being a mere conviction of the truth of God's word or a conclusion drawn from certain premises. It is the ear which has heard God say that he will do, the eye which has seen him doing it, and therefore, where there is true faith, it is impossible, but the answer must come. If we only see to it that we do the one thing that he asks of us as we pray, believe that ye have received. He will see to it that he does the thing he has promised. He shall have them. The keynote of Solomon's prayers, Second Chronicles 6, 4. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth to my father David, is the keynote of all true prayer, the joyful adoration of a God whose hand always secures fulfillment of what his mouth has spoken. Let us in this spirit listen to the promise Jesus gives. Every part of it has its divine message. All things whatsoever. At this first word, our human wisdom at once begins to doubt and ask, This surely cannot be literally true. But if it be not, why did the Master speak it, using the very strongest expression he could find? Quote, All things whatsoever. Unquote. And it is not as if this were the only time he spoke thus. It is not he, no, is it not he, who also said, quote, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Unquote. Quote, if ye have faith, nothing shall be impossible to you. Unquote. Faith is so holy the work of God's Spirit through his word and the prepared heart of the believing disciple that it is impossible that the fulfillment should not come. Faith is the pledge and forerunner of the coming answer. Yes, all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye receive. The tendency of human reason is to interpose here, and with certain qualifying clauses, if expedient, if according to God's will, to break the force of a statement which appears dangerous, to let us beware of dealing thus with the Master's words. His promise is most literally true. He wants his oft-repeated all things to enter into our hearts and reveal to us how mighty the power of faith is, how truly the head calls the member to share with him in his power, how holy our Father places his power at the disposal of the child that wholly trusts him. In this, all things, faith is to have its food and strength. As we weaken it, we weaken faith, though whatsoever is unconditional. The only condition is that is what is implied in the believing. Ere we can believe, we must find out and know what God's will is. Believing is the exercise of a soul surrendered and given up to the influence of the Word and the Spirit. But when once we do believe, nothing shall be impossible. God forbid that we should try and bring down His all things to the level of what we think possible. Let us now simply take Christ whatsoever as the measure and the hope of our faith. It is a seed word which, if taken just as he gives it, 
and kept in the heart will unfold itself and strike root. Fill our life with its fullness and bring forth fruit abundantly. All things whatsoever ye pray and ask for. It is in prayer that these all things are to be brought to God, to be asked and received of him. The faith that receives them is the fruit of the prayer. In one aspect there must be faith before there can be prayer. In another, the faith is the outcome and the outgrowth of prayer. It is in the personal presence of the Savior, in intercourse with Him, that faith rises to grasp what at first appeared too high. It is in prayer that we hold up our desire to the light of God's holy will, that our motives are tested and proof given, whether we ask indeed in the name of Jesus and only for the glory of God. It is in prayer that we wait for the leading of the Spirit to show us whether we are asking the right thing and in the right spirit. It is in prayer that we become conscious of our want of faith, that we are led on to say to the Father that we do believe, and that we prove the reality of our faith by the confidence with which we persevere. It is in prayer that Jesus teaches and inspires faith. He that waits to pray or loses heart in prayer, because he does not yet feel the faith needed to get the answer, will will never learn to believe. He who begins to pray and ask will find the spirit of faith is given nowhere so surely as at the foot of the throne. Believe that you have received. It is clear that what we are to believe is what we we receive the very things we ask. The Savior does not hint that because the Father knows what is best, he may give us something else. The very mountain faith bids depart is cast into the sea. There is a prayer in which, in everything, we make known our request with prayer and supplication, and the reward is the sweet peace of God keeping heart and mind. This is the prayer of trust. It has reference to things of which we cannot find out if God is going to give them. As children, we make known our desires in the countless things of daily life, and leave it to the Father to give or not as he thinks best. But the prayer of faith of which Jesus speaks is something different, something higher. When whether in the greater interest of the Master's work or in the lesser concerns of our daily life, the soul is led to see how there is nothing that so honors the Father as the faith that is assured that he will do what he has said in giving us whatsoever we ask for and takes its stand on the promise we have brought home by the Spirit, it may know most certainly that it does receive exactly what it asks. Just see how clearly the Lord sets this before us in verse 23. Quote, Whatsoever shall not, no, whosoever shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that what he saith cometh to pass, he shall have it. Unquote. This is the blessing of the prayer of faith of which Jesus speaks, believe that ye have received. This is the word of central importance, of which the meaning is too often misunderstood. Believe that ye have received. Now, while praying the thing you ask for, it may only be later that you shall have it in personal experience, that you shall see what you believe. But now, without seeing, you are to believe that it has been given you of the Father in heaven. The receiving or accepting of an answer to prayer is just like the receiving or accepting of Jesus or of pardon, a spiritual thing, an act of faith apart from all believing. When I come as a supplicant for pardon, I believe that Jesus in heaven is for me, and so I receive or take him. When I come as a supplicant for any special gift, which is according to God's word, I believe that what I ask is given me. I believe that I have it. I hold it in faith. I thank God that it is mine. If he know, if we know that we, he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions which we have asked of him. And ye shall have them. That is the gift which we first hold in faith as bestowed upon us in heaven will also become ours in personal experience. But will it be needful to pray longer if once we know we have been heard and have received what we asked? 
There are cases in which such prayer will not be needful, in which the blessing is ready to break through at once. If we but hold fast our confidence and prove our faith by praising for what we have received in the face of faith in the face of our not yet having it in experience. There are other cases in which the faith that has received 